You're hiking with friends in the desert when a strange man appears out of nowhere and offers to help you. Do you A. Accept this help? B. Tell him you do not want his help and that he needs to leave. Or C. Push him off a cliff and bury his body before he kills you and your friends. Here's the story. Who the hell are you? Reggie looked on at the unknown stranger who had entered our camp, unsure of what to make of him. The stranger had been there when we woke up, but hadn't yet said a word. I was kicking myself for not bringing along a gun, but it was only meant to be a two-day hike in the canyon. There weren't any stories of dangerous animals attacking such a well-known trail, so we figured we'd be fine. I'll ask again, who are you? Reggie said, this time with more confidence. The stranger looked at Reggie and smiled completely undeterred by Reggie's sudden show of masculinity. The stranger's appearance wasn't what was so frightening. It was the fact that he was so completely out of place. The stranger was dressed in a full suit that didn't seem to fit his frame. He was tall and lanky, but the suit seemed about two sizes too small. In comparison, Reggie, Clayton and I were all dressed in hiking shorts and t-shirts. The temperature was well over 90 degrees, even down in the canyon. This man should have been sweltering, but I couldn't see a single drop of sweat. I was just in the area. I thought you boys might need some help, the stranger said, his lips moving a little too much as he said each word. I'm from the area, and a lot of kids end up lost hiking these trails. I saw your tent and figured you all must have just gotten exhausted from the trek down the canyon. We're actually fine, thank you. Clayton jumped in. We've hiked this trail before and we're actually meeting our friends just about a mile up the trail. They'll be expecting us. Clayton was smart. He always had a cool head and knew exactly what to say and how to react. We appreciate the concern, sir, but we've got to get going now. We slept in a bit too late and were already behind schedule. As he said this, he started to pack up his things, being careful to never turn his back to the stranger. Reggie followed suit, and so did I. The stranger made no effort to move and in fact looked even more pleased with our obvious unease. You know, the stranger said, moving ever so slightly closer to the three of us, you boys don't realize how screwed you are. With that, the stranger stood up showing his height, far taller than what I expected, and walked off down the canyon. Reggie wanted to attack him, I was sure of it, but he was paralyzed. Reggie is someone who never backed down, and certainly not someone who scared off easily. What was that about? Reggie whispered. Whatever it was, I think we need to get going right now, I said. I wasn't about to wait around and see if this guy came back. After an hour of hiking, we needed to take a break. The heat was taking a toll on us, and we'd started to forget about the stranger. We found a nice spot to set down our packs and relax for a moment, and now was as good as time as any to reapply some sunscreen. What do you guys think that dude was about? said Reggie. It felt like he was taunting us or something. He was being such a dick. He took this opportunity to flex the only part of his body he actually worked on, his biceps. I would have effed that guy up and he knew it. That's why he dipped so fast. You know what, I don't blame him. If Reggie weren't already my friend for years, he would have been insufferable. Clay and I just both rolled our eyes, a normal reaction to Reggie's antics. I think he was probably crazy. There's a lot of stories of locals out here smoking meth, and we really aren't that far from the normal trail, Clayton said, as usual being the most level-headed of all of us. I mean, think about it. You're in this wasteland of a state. You have nothing to do in this hellscape of a town. What else are you going to do to entertain yourself? That's what people out here do, and when you smoke enough meth, well, you kind of lose it. Whether or not it was true, it eased our minds enough for us to pretty much forget the whole thing ever happened. If anything, it was just another crazy story we'd have between the three of us. We'd experienced plenty of weird shit in our years as friends, and this was just another story that we'd tell at the next house party. Reggie would exaggerate it, Clay would explain in detail what actually happened, and I would listen quietly, 
laughing on with everyone else as my best friends entertained everyone for the night. After another hour or so of hiking, we started to realize something. According to the trail map, we should be right at the mouth of the canyon. It was difficult to tell, but it seemed like we were still in the same area we were an hour before. On top of that, we woke up around 8 a.m., and the sun should have been well overhead by now. However, the sun seemed to be at a standstill. It looked like it hadn't moved at all since we woke up this morning. Clearly, I wasn't the only one who noticed, because Reggie started to look perplexed too, at least more perplexed than usual. What time is it? He asked no one, his voice slightly wavering. Clay checked his watch. It's 3 p.m., why? We woke up at like 8 or 9. We've only been walking for like what, 2 or 3 hours at most? The sun hasn't even moved. Reggie liked to play the part of the tough guy, but it was unsurprising that he would be the one freaking out the most. We both waited for Clay to say something logical and obvious that would calm us down. Well, maybe we're all really tired. We probably woke up earlier than we thought, right? I mean, we all got pretty jacked up last night after we set up camp. No one actually checked the time because that freak showed up, remember? We probably woke up earlier and it feels like we've been walking so long because it's so damn hot. Being hungover isn't helping, right? Thank God Clay could be the voice of reason. Because I could tell Reggie was just as unsettled as I was. It didn't explain why the sun didn't look like it had moved. But we all just chalked it up to us being hungover. Still, there was the slightest waver to Clay's voice. I usually tend to over-examine everything, and Reggie didn't mention it. So I figured I was being paranoid. Okay. Okay, what the hell's going on here? I said. Something isn't right about this, and you guys know it. The sun is still in the same place. We've been walking for hours. We should have been out of this godforsaken canyon hours ago. Clay and Reggie were completely shocked by my outburst. The last time I was this upset was when I met him. I was in the boys' room about to have my face dunked in the toilet, a sick prank older boys learned about from movies where the nerd got a swirly. Clay and Reggie came at the right time. While Clay distracted them for completing their makeshift water torture, Reggie swooped in and beat the shit out of him. From that day on, we were best friends. Chill, Marcus, Reggie said, putting his hands up like I was going to suddenly attack him. We're just hungover. You don't drink a lot. It's fine. No, no, it's not fine. The sun has been in the same spot for hours. That's not normal, I said. He's right, Clay jumped in. I'm trying to think about this logically. But the sun really hasn't moved. And I'm kind of starting to get freaked out. Dude, relax. Reggie said. The guy who normally would have been the one to lose his shit first was suddenly telling us to come down. We're hung over. You guys are acting like there's some conspiracy with the sun or some shit. He laughed and dragged his fingers through his forever gelled perfect black hair. Clay looked at me. And at that moment, I got chills. I saw the stranger, nowhere close to us, but far into the canyon where we originally saw him. He stood facing us, making a strange motion with his hands, like he was playing the violin. What the hell? I said. Turn, turn around, it's that guy from the camp. Marcus, there's nothing there, Reggie said not at all concerned with the prospect that this man was following us, watching us. You know what, Reggie, it's the heat. He's losing it because of the heat, Clay said, putting his hand over my head as if he was a medical professional who could determine heat stroke by feel when we'd all been in the same environment. You know what, why don't we take a quick break and get some rest? Clay actually looked worried about me. Reggie didn't seem to care either way. I don't need to rest. I'm telling you, that guy was over there, across the canyon. Something feels wrong. I, I don't know what it is, but I think we need to call for help or something. You're being dramatic. Reggie started to look pissed. Our phones won't even work. We're too deep in the canyon. 
Just take a break and you can sleep it off or whatever. We've got to be close to the end by now anyways. I knew I didn't hallucinate it, but I was tired. It couldn't hurt to take some time to rest for now, especially if the sun wasn't going anywhere. When I woke up, it was pitch black. I was freezing and I couldn't see a thing. Reg? Clay, where the hell did you guys go that... Ah! I got cut short by a searing pain in my right bicep. What the hell? I'd never felt pain like this in my life. The lack of sight added to the disorientation I felt from the already blinding pain. I reached into my pocket and grabbed my lighter, hoping to gain a little more insight into the current situation I'd woken up to. My arm was completely wedged between the canyon and an unfortunately placed rock. I wasn't sure if I rolled over in my sleep or what. We didn't set up the tent when we took a break earlier. I looked around for Reggie and Clayton, but with only the flame from the lighter, it was near impossible to see a few feet ahead of me. Help! Help me! I said. It was useless. No one could hear me. No one was coming. I was alone in this canyon, and I wasn't sure if my friends would be there to save me this time. It wasn't long before I slipped into unconsciousness again. Wake up, Marcus. Wake up, dude. Reggie was shaking me awake. Clay isn't here. Did you see him leave? I looked down to see both my arms attached and not stuck between any rocks. My relief was cut short when I realized what was happening. That creep showed up again. He came back while you were sleeping and he started saying all this cryptic shit again. He was so sketchy, Marcus. He said some shit to Clay and walked away and, and Clay went after him. I tried to chase him down and I don't know where he went, man, but I'm freaking out. I'd never seen Reg so shaken in all the years as his friend. Reggie, while thick-headed, was always brave. He never got shaken up, and if he got started, he reacted with bravado, not fear. It was at this point that Reggie started crying. I... I didn't stop him, man. That piece of shit was real thin. I, I could have kicked his ass. I should have done it when he showed up the first time, man. Why didn't I take him down when I had the chance? Reggie was sobbing. I'd never seen anyone, let alone Reggie, cry so hard. I understood him, though. Whatever it was about this man was terrifying. It shook us all to the core. As selfish as it is, I'm just glad I was asleep when he showed up again. Okay, Reg, calm down for a second. Where exactly did the man go? Reggie pointed toward some bushes that seemingly led off a cliff. I walked over and realized there was a very thin, rocky path towards the bottom of the canyon. They went down here. Let's go. We started down the trail with Reggie rushing ahead. I followed cautiously, but almost immediately I felt a burning pain in my bicep. It felt almost like the dream I had earlier, but before I could think too much about it, I heard Reggie cry out. Reggie had slipped on the loose rocks and fallen a few feet down the trail. He wasn't far ahead, but he'd fallen into some bushes. I climbed down and I could see it. His body was rigid, in complete contrast to his totally limp leg that was bent at the knee in the opposite direction it should have been. His skin was ripped to the bone, to the point where I could see his kneecap between the muscle. I couldn't help but vomit. I'd never seen something so grisly. His hands were gripping his upper thigh, trying to somehow control the blood from pouring out of the artery poking out of his leg. His kneecap was shattered, pieces of it lay around him on the dirt path. His calf was almost completely amputated from his thigh and twisted completely around, with his foot pointing towards his back. His eyes were closed tight. How bad is it, man? Tell me the truth. It hurts like a bitch, man. Is it... is it broken? I didn't even know what to tell him. I didn't want to send him into shock, and I definitely didn't want him to see the damage. The adrenaline must have been pumping hard for him even to still be conscious at this point. He let go for just a second, 
and blood started squirting out. Reggie, Reggie, just keep pressure where you had it. Give me a second. You, you, you're going to be okay, I said. I grabbed my pocket knife and sliced off a piece of the bottom of his shorts and quickly wrapped a tourniquet in the middle of his thigh as tight as I could. Oh, man, it, it hurts. What are you doing? He said. It was at this point that Reggie made the mistake of looking. Before he could even scream, his eyes rolled back and he passed out. Thankfully, I got his leg to stop bleeding. But before I could even try to do any more to help, I heard a blood curdling scream from deep in the canyon. It was Clay. There wasn't much I could do for Reggie without a phone and without any medical supplies. We were so unprepared for this hike that we thought would be a simple camping trip. I couldn't do anything but leave him my canteen and put a shirt behind his head and hope that he'd stay asleep until I got back. For a good measure, I left the rest of our whiskey supply by his side. Just in case. I followed the scream I heard from Clay deeper into the canyon. This is far deeper than we'd been before and I had no idea where I was. The sun was still in the same place and I was starting to wonder if this was a dream. Reggie. Marcus. Please, please God help me. If this was a dream, I didn't care. Clay needed help. I'm coming, Clay. Hold tight, man. I'm almost there. Be careful. It's really dark, man. I wasn't sure what Clay was talking about. It was sunny and I could see everything clearly, even this deep in the canyon. The sun was directly above us and it lit up the entire trail. Just as I started to ponder that, my bicep started to burn again. I rolled up my sleeve to see if something had bit me or something, but my arm was completely fine. The pain was almost unbearable, but there was nothing there. Clay, the, the sun's out. It's not dark out here. Is it dark where you are? Did you slip somewhere and, and fall in a cave or something? I yelled out. No response. Clay? Nothing. I kept walking. At this point, there wasn't an incline anymore. The sun was still blaring down, but luckily I was deep enough that the area I was in was completely shaded. I'd reached the bottom of the canyon. Clay? Still no response. I had no idea which way to turn. The canyon had an echoing effect that made it impossible to tell where Clay had called from earlier. The ground down here was cool. The rocks had been eroded throughout and the walls of the canyon were smooth as I dragged my hand along them. I thought back to science class in high school. We learned about caves and stalagmites and how canyons came to be through erosion. I remember thinking how powerful water was to be able to carve through rock and create something as beautiful and deep as the Grand Canyon. Marcus! I heard where the voice came from. I ran towards the sound right around the next pass, and just as I rounded the corner, I slipped. The pain? It was impossible to ignore this time. My arm was burning, but I couldn't feel my hand at all. I looked down to see the same horrifying sight I'd seen in my dream. My arm was completely collapsed at the bicep, stuck between the canyon wall and an enormous boulder. Clayton, Clayton, where are you? No response again. It was bright out at least, but I almost wish it was dark so I couldn't see my arm. It was as gory as Reggie's leg, but the sight of my arm being completely compressed between the rocks was horrifying. The veins in my biceps were turning a bright purple, and the muscle itself looked like it was sunburnt. From the slight amount of medical knowledge I had from biology and TV, I knew that even if I were able to dislodge my arm, I could get compartment syndrome. Compartment syndrome is usually caused by a traumatic crushing injury, like a limb being crushed between two rocks. I knew that if I were to get my arm out, I could possibly die without medical attention. Clayton, anyone, please, I said. And I couldn't help it, I started crying. The hopelessness set in. 
I was at the bottom of this canyon. No one knew where we were. One friend was missing, and the other was completely immobile, maybe even dead by now. I had no idea how much time had passed since Reggie broke his leg, because the sun was still in the same spot. I looked around desperately for anything that could help me. I had nothing, not even the whiskey, because I'd left that for Reggie. As I was frantically scanning the canyon floor, I noticed someone. Clayton? Clayton, man, you gotta help me. Call 911. The figure started to move closer to me, seemingly gliding along the canyon floor. His legs were moving at a slow pace, but he was moving towards me at an impossible speed. My heart sunk. It was the stranger. I told you boys you would need help. I couldn't speak. I'd never been so terrified in my life. The stranger, who was already horrifying before, was physically distorted in the most subtle ways. If you'd ever heard of the uncanny valley, he resembled something from the deepest part of it. Now that I had the opportunity to see him in the light and standing tall, I could fully take in the terror of his appearance. The stranger stood at least six foot eight and incredibly thin. He couldn't have weighed more than 150 pounds soaking wet. His suit clung to his bones, but still seemed to be far too baggy on his frame. His skin was pale, not white, but far too pale for someone who would live in this desert. His blonde hair was perfectly styled in a swooped back 50s cut, but still looked matted and dirty. His eyes were light blue, and if you came across this man in a normal situation, you might even find him attractive, if it wasn't for his slim frame. The thing that was so incredibly unsettling, though, was his smile. No one should be smiling anyways at seeing someone in this condition, but regardless, his mouth was upturned in the most disgusting smile you can imagine. His teeth were perfectly straight, white as snow, but wrong. It looked almost as if he had too many teeth crammed into his mouth, like if a child were to draw a person smiling but didn't understand what a human mouth looked like. Do you want to leave? He asked, his head tilting ever so slightly. Would you like me to help you? I couldn't say anything. I couldn't even shake my head no. Well, if you don't want my help, I won't force it. Your friends wouldn't take my advice either. I hope you're not as foolish. He backed away walking slowly, but disappearing into the distance far too quickly for how he was moving. As he was walking, he did the same motion, almost as if he was playing the violin. The farther away he got from me, the more I pieced it together. I realized the advice he was giving me. I had nothing to do this with but a shitty knife I'd bought at a flea market. It was serrated on the back, but could barely qualify as an actual hunting knife. I figured I'd only need it to cut rope or something. We were so unprepared for this hike. I searched around my pocket with my free left hand to find my cigarettes. If this didn't work out, then I died from this. I certainly was going to have a cigarette in my final moment. I put one of my last camels into my mouth, and just as I lit the lighter, Everything went dark. I didn't pass out. It was nighttime. I looked around, bewildered. It was the same as my dream. The rock, the lighter, the searing pain in my arm. Everything was the same. A shaking hand brought the cigarette to my lips as I took a drag. This wasn't right. Nothing made sense. The pain took me away from my thoughts. I needed to do this now before I passed out, because I was going to die out here if I didn't do something now. I pulled my crappy knife from its sheath, suddenly thankful to get dragged to that flea market years ago. With a cigarette hanging between my gritted teeth, I cut the bottom of my shirt to fashion a tourniquet. I doubt I tied it tight enough, 
being able to only use my non-dominant hand, but it was better than nothing. I finished my cigarette, took a deep, labored breath, and started cutting. At first, the pain was blinding. Literally. I couldn't even see as I started to saw through my own flesh. After about 30 seconds of this, my brain gave me a bit of solace and started to cancel out the pain I was feeling. I was focused, more focused than I've ever been. I remembered reading something years ago that a human has enough bite force to bite off their finger and it would be only as difficult as biting a carrot. But your brain prevents you from doing it. I guess the brain is able to get rid of that instinct if it realizes it's a life or death situation. As I continued to saw through my arm, I was strangely calm. All I was focused on was this one thing. The pain, the fear, the cold. Nothing was distracting me from this task until I hit the nerve. If the pain I'd felt from being stuck was bad, and the pain I felt from cutting through the muscle was awful, then the pain of cutting through the nerve was worse than anything I could ever compare it to. The only way I could even begin to describe it is if you were to get the root canal, but the dentist was drilling directly into the nerve of your tooth with no Novocaine. Imagine that, but make it a thousand times worse, and the pain is radiating up your arm throughout your entire body and out your ears and eyes. That's maybe as bad as it was, except I was doing it to myself and I had no choice but to keep going. Blood was squirting out at this point. My brain felt like it was on fire from the pain of cutting my nerve, and now I'd gotten to the bone. I didn't even think about the bone, or what it would look like. It was quite a visual, to see your own bone under your muscle and the layer of fat on top of it. I was honestly surprised at how white it was. I think because our teeth yellow with time, I'd assume that bones would maybe be similar. But no, it was pristine. Aside from the blood and everything, of course, I tried using the serrated edge of the knife first before I realized how painful this was for such little progress. While the nerve pain was the worst I've ever felt, at least it only took a second to cut through it. The bone was something I would need to saw through, and just the thought of how long it would take made me vomit. There was one other option, though and it was a lot faster. I thought about how I'd need to break it, and then I took a deep breath, and I ran forward with all my might. There was a crack. I heard it before I felt it. I didn't even want to look. I knew it'd be gruesome. I pulled a bit without looking to try to tell if the bone was completely broken, but it was just more pain. I took a deep breath and looked, and my face fell. The bone was now fractured in such a way that it split into shards. The shards were poking through the skin right above my tourniquet, and it was slowly leaking blood. I'm gonna die, I thought. I needed to stop the bleeding. The tourniquet was already so high on my arm, I wasn't sure if I could do a second one higher. And the bone was poking out almost at my shoulder. Oh god, oh god. Okay, think, Marcus. What can you do right now to not die? I realized that the only thing preventing me from bleeding out right now was my bone plugging the hole. If I tried to pull it out, it would start squirting blood and I would surely pass out and die. The only option I had now was trying to saw through the rest of the fracture and the rest of the flesh if I wanted a chance to get out alive. Now I regretted not taking the whiskey, not seeing 127 hours, and going on this stupid trip. I woke up warm, but not too warm, not blinding hot sun in the desert warm, comfortable warm. My eyes adjusted to the incredibly bright white light 
not the sun, but fluorescence. As I came to, I heard the distinct beeping of hospital machinery. I made it. I don't know how, but somehow I made it. Where's Reggie and Clay? That was the first thing I asked. I needed to know what happened. Where was Clay? How'd he get down there? W was Reggie all right? What happened to his leg? I am sorry, Marcus, but your friends didn't make it. My stomach dropped. The doctor looked on half-heartedly. You're a very brave man. Your story has made you something of a local celebrity. My friends are dead, I just said. And then I saw people in the doorway. My family was there. My mother ran over to me crying. We thought we'd lost you. When we heard about Reggie and Clayton, we... Her voice trailed off. Thank God for that man. You would have died if he didn't find you. Mom, what are you talking about? What man? As the words left my lips, I could see a figure in the doorway. He was tall, and he needed to bend down to enter the room. All I could do was scream as the stranger walked up to my bed, smiled with too many teeth, and said, I told you you'd need my help. <laughs>